After some unfortunate sales years in 1986 through 1991, Cadillac redid its Seville for the 1992 model year in a quite revolutionary form. The car had a distinctive look that was all its own, very different from the model that preceded it. And in a previous video on this channel, we've walked around my 1994 Cadillac Seville STS with its chief exterior designer, Dick Ruzin. Dick then explained a number of the design features, but in this particular video, we are going to supplement that part one of this series by describing some features about the car's aerodynamics and how designers incorporated aerodynamics into their styling. By the way, Dick, in addition to being the former chief designer for Cadillac, has recently authored a book about design at General Motors called Designing Dreams. And I had the good fortune of authoring the last chapter in this book. I highly recommend you check it out. It's available for sale on Amazon and other places, and I'll put a link to the book in the video description. But for now, let's watch Dick walk around my 1994 STS and talk more about how the design team incorporated aerodynamics into the car. I'll also put a link to part one of the video series on this 1992 Seville in the description as well, where Dick talks about the design itself. All right, so let's talk about the aerodynamics of the car now that we've talked about the design. So Dick, what are your thoughts? I mean, you had, as you mentioned, you had experience in aerodynamics from your time working uh, on the X cars and yeah. with Claire McKeegan and team. Right. How did how did that, let's say, play into this particular vehicle? Well, what what happened was, uh, I went from working on the X cars to Advanced Studio uh, and then uh, Chevrolet Two Studio, where we did uh, had a great group of people there. We did a lot of a lot of great work there. And I never, from the time I left the X car program, I never thought of designing cars any other way. I mean, that was just the way I would do it. Now, I thought everybody was kind of in the same spot, but they weren't. Because the, the production studios were not involved in all that aerodynamic work we did. They, they inherited the processes through the people that would work with them uh, on their different programs, but they weren't involved in the learning processes as I was. Mm. So I was in a little special spot. So uh, I would never choose anything to go on the clay model that wasn't going to be good arrow. I mean, it was just, would not do that. It was just automatic. So um, when it got to the El Dorado and the Seville, that's what I was doing. The Caprice was outstanding aerodynamically, and so was the the Lumina and the Lumina APV, those two. Um, so nobody in working on these cars, this car or the Eldorado, the total focus was we have to have a car that looks great that people are going to like. Mm. Nobody cared about the fuel economy, the aerodynamics, or anything other than that. But what happened in the end, we ended up with two outstanding cars aerodynamically. This, this car, uh, we go through some of the, I would say it, it really starts with the platform because the classic aero platform, uh, which you'll see in French cars way, way back into the 40s, the rear track is narrower than the front track. Hmm. And that's to allow two things. One, you don't want your rear tires to go in the same track as your front tires when you're driving through the snow. That's one thing. But second to that is you want the rear of the car to tuck in for good aerodynamics, to give you a platform for good aerodynamics. So that's what this car does. And uh, um, that allows us to get uh, attachment so the air attaches at the front and stays with the, with the car all the way to the back. But because if, this is tucking in. If you look from here, if you bring your camera, Right, right there, Adam. What you're going to see, oh, you see. can see how these these surfaces are sweeping up and around, hmm. and the the same thing is happening with the roof. Now we did this little break on the roof. Would I don't think it does anything. Um, and then you want the the air coming off the roof to attach here to the deck lid. Hmm. Now, why do you want that? You want that because when you drive a car 
and it's going through the air, it creates a hole in the air. And how big that hole is, is what is called the drag. That vacuum is pulling, is trying to pull the car back. So the smaller you can make that wake, it's like a wake on a boat, if you think about that. Sure. The smaller you can make on the, that wake, the smaller is the drag. So by having contact connection here between the roof and the deck lid, and by sweeping this in, we're making that wake small. And so that was very important. And then the sail panel here sweeps in even more. So all of this air, and you can see what's been done here. You can see how that sweeps in, and you see how this is all flush yes. here? That, that's all to uh, make sure, the, uh, you know, so the air stays attached as much as possible. I mean, for a car of this age, this is really quite flush. You won't, you won't really see it much better than this up until probably 2010 on cars. Uh, even here, you, you know, the pillar, you can see the pillar is how flush it is here. And on, on this glass, we were able to keep it flush all the way. By the time it gets to the back, there's this little step in here that you can't get rid of because you've got, you have to have so much for uh, manufacturing for the belt. They, they've got to have enough mm. to, to, to stamp that piece out and make all that happen there. So this step was dictated by manufacturing. No, well, this this step is. I see. Results in this step. I got it. Because you, you end up pulling okay. that in. In the front, we were able to avoid it, and part of the part of the avoidance, the belt line rising, and then the patch being put in here. We were able to put the patch here, and that made it smooth. And by the uh, time we got here, see, we're we're it, it's almost gone. So it's, it's it's quite flush right here. This mere shark fin. Uh, yeah, that's right. Interesting. And the door handles flush, nothing sticking out. Um, Were the air, the limousine style doors uh, always considered, or? Well, you know, the, there were at this, at, there were a lot of considerations at this time. Uh, with the Deville that followed, they wanted um, to weld the roof to the 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 body inner by having a slot here mm -hmm. but on this car they weren't there so this is finished and um, there are a lot of different ways to do doors into a roof but this was one of the you know they're all they all have different economics and so this was the one that was the you know the most efficient and uh, uh, l lower in cost and it also gave us this flush look mm. and it gave us this really flush look here uh, for drag so that, that it was a very good choice. I have to ask Dick this divider bar here for the window glass this these windows only go down about halfway yeah. was there ever any consideration to moving it further forward? Yeah well or it, you wanted it to look good? Well no there's two issues here yeah you could move it forward but you have to consider the rear passenger you know they're they're trying to see uh, and the more that thing goes forward they're they're starting to get claustrophobic right I see so this and probably people are not going to drive this car very often with the window down it's air conditioning you know you got all those considerations and you've got is the low nose also something that helps for the arrow too just to have a low a, a small frontal area well, in effect no the frontal area is if you look at the if you look at a, a drawing of this car that's the frontal area. It's not this. Ah, okay. And the whole thing. And if you have a car with a luggage carrier on it, yes, and it's sitting up there four inches, that's part of the frontal area. Oh. And it hurts your fuel economy. Because if you see it in the winter when snow is on it, yes, it's filled up with snow. So the air is going right up over the top, which means you, I, I think if you take that off most cars, you gain about a mile per gallon. But anyway, um, having if you look at this, the curves here are all trying to round. There's a peak, but they're trying to round. So if this were a continuous round shape, mm -hmm. that's what it's trying to do. The bumpers, you don't have a lot of opportunity to do much. You see, we did chamfer this. 
oh, so okay. that chamfer this so that the air w wouldn't have because what it'll do here it would hit that sharp edge and it would start to be oh. turbulent and you want it to just go right into the into the uh, to the radiator area so that's that's one of the little things we did and then we we took that and made that into something that you know worked here wow were there any cooling challenges with this car with the v8 that you no nope. no no nope, never this worked no and you know the dam is a lot of it uh you have to have now for this car we didn't have i don't think there's anything was d uh, done under it aerodynamically no. they, they do that today they do all kinds of stuff yeah but for us we didn't do we didn't have that opportunity so it's just where this dam can be in height and how forward it has to be to cause a vacuum behind the radiator. That's what the dam uh, does. I see. So the dam, now there, there is an opportunity. You can have it out here so you can see it, or you could have it back there, a little vertical dam. Yes. But it made the car look a little more aggressive, you know, by having it out here. And uh, so that, that's what we did. So when you get to this this car, special model, more sporty, more performance oriented, then you know having some of those cues kind of helps tell you you know that this car is not a regular grocery store car. That's what I like to tell people. This and, isn't my regular grocery store and, car. And you know <laughs> the, the thing about the Seville, um, Cadillac had to. I think the corporation was probably in on it. They had to decide, when you go for car of the year, you, you don't let them pick the car. You, you pick the car and you say, this is the one we want you to look at. Ah, you sponsor okay. a car. So right? in this case, they had an Eldorado and they had a Seville. So they, they decided to, that the Seville would be the car that they would promote for car of the year. Um, and they had a, a car, a prototype that was pretty rough, but it ran good. And they took all these guys to the proving ground independently and let them drive that car. They drove it around the, uh, the track. Keith Crane, I saw Keith Crane once, he said he had driven it. And he said when, when they drove it around on the bank, it was like a race car. So it felt really good. So it won all four Car of the Year awards. Hmm. No other car had ever done that. It was the first time. And, and uh, when um, you read those articles, it almost looks like they were all in the same room when they wrote them. They, they all had the same impression of the car, the way it felt, the way it drove, how it looked. How it looked was a big, big deal. In terms of how it looked, was this uh, rake of the windshield at all contentious or? No. No? No. No, it had to go, well, the, the windshield, um, of course it was done on the previous platform, the one, from the smaller cars. Yeah. So the tread had to be wider, the longer wheelbase, uh, rear overhang was different. Um, you know, the, the, I don't know how they did the underbody. I don't think they made it wider. I think they were, the doors are just out and they just sweep in more. Some things worked in concert that way. But the, the I would say the, the cowl, what we call the cowl, when you open the hood, you see that sheet metal. That's probably in the same place as the the uh, uh, smaller cars were, and and you know there's another one here that carries uh, the radiator. Sure. And that was shared between the Eldorado and the Seville, and that was probably the same. Okay. Like the radiator support yeah. cradle, or yeah, and everybody wanted the bigger wheels for the STS, but uh, they would have had it. I think that I think it was like 2,500 body trucks or something, they would have had to change. Huge investment. And it was all because of that, there's a little tube in there that those things go up into and it got in the way of the tire for this uh, 17 inch wheel. Because the tire was a little wider. I see. Well, what a fantastic design with great aerodynamics. Uh, and it's interesting you were able to leverage that experience that you had from years prior. I didn't know I was doing it. <laughs> I was just doing it. And it came out looking great. Like you said, the car still looks great. You know, and, yeah, great. and um, mirrors, you know, people look at a mirror, well, it's a mirror. But 
we learned that we could position these mirrors so that, and there's a lot of criteria that goes into a mirror. Re, re, you know, it's rear view vision, so sure. it's really serious. And there's a triangle here you have to meet. But you can position the mirror so that when the water is coming off, it's raining and you have the wipers throwing the water and the water is coming off, it's going to go up here, not come around here and be in the mirror. And that's what you'll see if you drive this car in the rain. You're going to see the water sweep up and go over the mirror. And that's all done by uh, aerodynamic studies and positioning the mirror hmm. in a certain spot. And then we would design the mirror to be there. Wow. So you have, you're designing the and, mirror in this shark fin and yeah. filleted and, Yeah, all there. of that would come on. And then you, you also had to accommodate the other criteria for uh, vision. That, it, mirrors are complicated, quite complicated. And then, of course, on the X car, we eliminated the drip molding. Remember that? Yes. Cars all had drip molding. And we did that in the wind tunnel. And there were people, engineers there from, for, from Fisher Body <laughs> to make sure we were going to tell them the truth, <laughs> I guess, to see what happened. And it was a dramatic improvement, not only for aerodynamics, but for wind noise. Because we, we made a wind, uh, wind tunnel model for the X car that had what they call was an anechoic chamber. Mm -hmm. And it had a, a floor in it. It had a plexiglass windshield that was supposed to be the same sound density or whatever as, uh, as glass. Uh, research laboratories worked with us because they had to, after the test was done, they had to configure and release the official test that other divisions would use. And uh, we, we had a microphone in there, and uh, so all the wind noise and everything, we were able to capture that, change the, the drip molding, get rid of it, and the difference was dramatic. Well, Dick, this was a great walk around of uh, your baby here, and just wanted to say thanks again for another, uh, another lesson in design and aerodynamics and <laughs> Uh, walk around a vehicle that you yeah. clearly know very well. Yeah, well, it, 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 I didn't even think about uh, the aerodynamics, the significance of it, until I was writing that story. There's a story in uh, deansgarage.com. And uh, suddenly I realized, you know, nobody cared about it. Nobody said a word about it. And yet we did it anyway, because that's the way, you know, that's the way I was doing everything at that point in time. Well, it turned out great. And thanks again for your time and look forward to talking about more vehicles yeah, that you worked well, on. Thank, thank you, Adam. And don't forget, I would say for the viewers, Dick uh, has authored a new book called Designing Dreams. It's really an exposition about design at General Motors as well as uh, a special focus on the 1966 Tornado. And D Dick was one of the designers for that car. I'll be sure to put a link in the video description and. Thankfully, Dick asked me to author one chapter at the final yes. chapter. So. Yeah, it, it's outstanding. And uh, I would say anybody interested in Tornado uh, or maybe thinking of purchasing one should read, get that book and read Adam's chapter because it's very revealing and uh, will give you knowledge that I don't think any, uh, any car has ever had anything written like that about it because it covers the Tornado from its birth until now. Sure. And so I don't think there are any cars out there that anybody's written anything like that, where you can uh, uh, see all the things that happened to it, the performance, uh, the ride, the drive, everything, it's all there. Different problems that it had mechanically, you'll know about them. Adam has it all in there, it's terrific. So I'll be sure to put a link uh, in the description here too, but great book and thanks again, Dick, for yep. being here. Thank you, on. thank you, Adam. All right. Well, this concludes part two of the series on the 1992 Seville design. If you want to see part one, be sure to check the link in the video description and also stay tuned for part three. Thanks again for watching.